sign-up sheet that's being passed around, so we would love it if you would uh, sign up for us. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, first knowledge broadcast of this fiscal year, and it'll be the last knowledge broadcast of the calendar year. And uh, we're lucky today to have uh, Dr. Gordon Voss and Dr. Annette Ezer to talk about uh, human-centered design process and some uh, practical application in the um, Orion project. And again, this is part of our Human System Integration, or HSI, Knowledge Broadcast Series. Um, and my name is Debbie Burdich. Um, so when human performance is part of the total system performance, uh, why would you want to leave the human element to chance? If you're really working hard to make sure that the whole system performs as expected, um, and to understand how to make it do that, then you should consider the human um, as part of the equation. And if you wait until the end of the life cycle to do that, when the design's already done or you're already in operations, then, then you're really gonna have a, a low return on investment. Um, studies have shown, and uh, you know anybody who, who's worked uh, in industry for a while not even the space industry knows that if you don't address problems early on, that later you end up having to do expensive Band-Aid fixes that oftentimes uh, cost more money or uh, don't work or uh, uh, jeopardize safety. So even though it takes some time and some money to consider the human um, early and throughout the, the life cycle, uh, it, it's worth the investment because it can reduce some long-term uh, costs, you know, things like redesign, uh, training, operations, even, you know, in some cases limiting the people who can use the system. Uh, it it uh, eliminates or reduces safety concerns. And ultimately, considering the human and human health and performance early and often contributes to system success and to, to stakeholder satisfaction. So, you know, we talk about human, human system integration and what is human system integration. It's really integrating all those human health and performance concerns. And uh, it considers the end user in the design and development process as well as in the operational era. It regards the user as part of the operational concept it um, takes into regard uh, human performance limitations. It helps to identify those uh, vehicle, system, and mission uh, design drivers. A and it even helps to inform per personnel selection, as we uh, spoke of earlier. Um, so how does this relate to human engineering and human-centered design? Uh, well, you're gonna hear a whole lot more about that in just a couple of minutes. But, but just to, to kind of uh, whet your appetite, um, and I didn't coordinate this with Gordon and Netta, so I hope that I'm uh, not speaking out of bounds here or out of turn. But, you know, human engineering really helped. There, there are some very um, established uh, methods that can be, and design principles that can be applied throughout the life cycle. You know, it, it's uh, not all just guesswork. It's helping to take the guesswork out of what the human uh, performance uh, and limitations really are and how they affect the design of the mission, of the vehicle, of the system. Um, and, and it also addresses specific end user um, considerations. Uh, also human engineering, you know, not, along with uh, things like usability and anthropometry, uh, uh, human engineers also have general knowledge of human performance and they understand the air tendencies and how to relate those so that it's, it's understandable the, relation of the relationship of the human requirements to these operational concepts and to the designs. So ultimately, human engineering, it, it bridges that gap between when a user tells you Often a user tells you um, when something doesn't work or why it doesn't work, but doesn't, un doesn't necessarily put it in terms of what it should be before they have a chance to pre preview uh, a prototype or, 
um, some sort of a, a draft of code or something. Um, it, and they don't, don't necessarily often know how to put it in terms of uh, that, that engineers and designers and mission designers can understand. So human engineering helps to, to bridge that gap. It helps to integrate the end user's needs and capabilities with that system and mission design. And again, that leads ultimately to, to, to stakeholder um, uh, approval and to, to mission success. So uh, human engineering is one spoke on the wheel. It, it applies to uh, uh, several of these areas or domains which we would consider part of human system integration. Uh, so I would like to at this point welcome uh, Dr. Gordon Voss, uh, who will talk to you a little bit more about, um, about a human-centered design process. And let's go ahead, let me go ahead and get your charts up, Gordon, and let me pass over this microphone. And can you be over on this side so that makes sense of camera set up for you? I think we're having dueling mouse control, so I'll just wait. Well, thank you again for the introduction, Debbie. Really appreciate it. Uh, myself and Dr. Netta Ezra will be talking a little bit about uh, human engineering, human factors here at NASA, how we implement the human system integration process, and how that ties in with human-centered design. Uh, I'd also like to give some thankful acknowledgement to a few folks. Uh, like everybody, I don't work in a vacuum and have had a lot of help along the way. Uh, some of these slides have been shamefully pulled from other presentations with you know colors matched and everything, and uh, others were provided by people in this room right now. So thank you again. Uh, next slide. Oh, there we go. There we go. So what is human factors is probably the very first question I'd like to start with. Uh, human factors is a consideration of all the different capabilities that people have, whether it's strength, whether it's uh, cognitive capability, whether it's uh, you know attention, workload, all the different things that humans have to deal with in accomplishing a task. Human factors takes that into consideration. And it really is, at its very core, uh, an essence of human system integration. Uh, for many decades, human factors has taken this approach uh, with certain goals in mind. Uh, early on, it was simply improving effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, those are important ones, and they remain key ones today. Uh, they help make things cost justifiable. They help sell things, uh, changes or design changes to management. Uh, they have a very positive and measurable outcome that can be used to justify the time and expense it takes to effectively use human factors. Uh, other things that sometimes don't get quite as much service, um, verbally speaking, can be improving the safety, uh, customer satisfaction, the, the feel of an interface or something of that nature. There's a certain uh, human interaction and cognitive uh, back and forth between an interface and a person where you derive a certain amount of um, happiness or uh, frustration, quite likely, on the other hand, if it hasn't considered human factors. And, and that type of frustration or uh, satisfaction at using the interface can lead to either uh, a desire to use it more in the future, um, an increase in proficiency, an increase in the focus that you're willing to devote to it. Or on the other hand, if it's very unsatisfactory to use, you're more likely to think negatively about it, to not want to use it, to have problems with it. And that can also adversely lead to errors and things of that nature. So there's a lot of interaction going on. Uh, in the end, uh, one of the things we try to do is make sure that this happens very early on in the design phase. Uh, we like to come in uh, at the very genesis of an idea, um, if possible, if not, when prototyping is being done. <coughs> and at the very worst case, uh, come in after something's been designed and prototyped and go through the iteration. But preferably will be at every different stage along that process. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright put it the best way, um, an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the actual construction site. Uh, the next kind of thing to lead into then is where do we use human factors? Uh, obviously, we're here at NASA, so you'd think we use it in space, and you'd be correct. Um, but we also use it everywhere else. Everything you touch, the seats you're sitting in, the desk that your elbow is on, 
uh, the camera that the cameraman is operating, this keyboard, the mouse. Every interface that we use as people has a human factors component to it. Now, they may or may not have been designed with human factors in mind. Think about that while you're sitting there in your seats or using your computer during the day. Uh, there's sometimes uh, improvements that are thought of and sometimes things that come up after the fact. Um, for things that come up after the fact, uh, you know, we have companies that do surveys and things like that. We have uh, even our own Odin system has uh, a survey, a customer satisfaction survey on how their interface works and things of that nature. Uh, so whether it's hardware, uh, software, consumer electronics, uh, jet fighters, uh, spaceships, cars, I mean, all of it has a, a very strong and significant human factors component. So then we start to talk about where do we implement it. Uh, there's a lot of different types of interfaces that people work with. I tend to like to talk about uh, the manual, the mechanical, and the automated. Uh, the manual, very obviously, are things that are very simple devices, tools where the human supplies all the power. Something like a hammer, a screwdriver, scissors, very basic instruments. Uh, mechanical systems have a, a wide variety and probably most of the more complicated things we interact with would fall into this category. Uh, a car being probably uh, one of the most obvious examples. Other things, however, uh, such as automated systems are seen increasingly in the industrial arena. And uh, these could be, like we have here, a welding robot. Uh, they could be um, conveyor systems. There's a lot of different things that are used in industry. Um, pipelines, oil fields, all sorts of different places where they're used. Uh, those, even though they're automated, still need a human factors component from the standpoint of maintenance of those devices, from the standpoint of deploying them, interacting with them uh, at the programming side. You know, a, and a robotic arc welder doesn't just know how to arc weld. Someone has to sit down with a computer software interface and tell it where the points on a design and how long to hold the, the welding device in place and all those sorts of impacts. So basically everything we build as people has some sort of an interrelationship with human factors. Uh, we tend to focus on a very holistic approach, um, looking at not just the products and the equipment, but also the overall environment. Uh, taking into consideration things like lighting, um, the noise level, uh, other things that might interfere with interaction with the display. Um, talking about software and a computer screen, something as simple as the glare from a window that's open in the room, uh, a very classic example. Uh, again, the emphasis is on the human beings and making sure that we change the environment or change the interface itself to most effectively interact with that person. Because it's such a, a comprehensive and, and widespread field of science, there are a lot of different aspects to it. And there are people who make their entire careers of uh, research and investigation focusing on just individual points uh, along these different considerations. Uh, there are people who delve into information theory and the cognitive science of how people process data, how they can handle the juggling of multiple tasks, how they can selectively divide attention, what types of workload can they handle. Uh, Memory, you know, how many different things can you process in your mind and just keeping your memory at the same time. Uh, input modality refers to if you're being given data uh, through a computer screen, how do you respond? Do you respond also to that screen or do you respond verbally or through a physical button? Uh, you have a slider control, lots of different ways you can get and receive data. Uh, anthropometrics, which is more of the, the physical ergonomics of the human body. Uh, you have strength capability as well, visual acuity, and uh, acoustic sensitivity. Um, ultimately, failure to consider all these different components of the human capability can lead to fatigue, uh, frustration, errors, accidents. And ultimately, um, unfortunately, when you hear about major accidents, bridge failures and things like that, a lot of times they start to talk about human factors in the design. You know, and it could relate to the construction of the bridge, it could relate to uh, the way that it handled uh, traffic and the way that drivers would interact with it, uh, it has a very big impact. Uh, and for the space program, uh, system failures are unacceptable, uh, especially when the, the human is involved. We try to do everything that we can to ensure that design meets those capabilities of people. Any questions so far? I'm just kind of going right along. Okay. So as Daffy mentioned, uh, there's this larger concept of human system integration that ties together uh, not just the things that I've already talked about, but also um, medical aspects of things. Um, you know, the, gosh, there were like 30 different little items on your chart, and I won't try to repeat them all verbally, but it's a, it's a very holistic approach, comprehensive, 
Uh, it involves, of course, the scientific and technical sides of these fields, uh, but it also includes a management uh, aspect to it and uh, establishing a process by which you can tie those different fields together and make things interact and come up with uh, you know, an achievable, actionable outcome, something that you can actually change the design with. Uh, ultimately, this process is referred to as the human-centered design process. This process at a very high level has been captured by an ISO document, um, it's listed here 13407, uh, which is a very high level document. It doesn't go into a lot of detail. It presents four basic steps that are used in human-centered design. Um, you identify a need, of course. Uh, you define the context in which this interface or device will be used. Uh, you specify requirements. You create a design, you know, prototyping and things of that nature. You evaluate the design, which oftentimes here we refer to human in the loop testing. And then either you iterate back to the definition and requirements and prototyping and continue that cycle over and over again, or eventually you'll drop out and the design will be complete. Dropping out is probably not the right word. It'll, it'll lift out of the process. Uh, all of these different things are spoken to uh, with the work that we do here at NASA. And I believe on the next slide, uh, it's not quite on the next slide, so I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about it here. Um, under specifying requirements, we have things like our human system uh, integration group and human system integration requirements like HSIR. Uh, oftentimes, that's where uh, the human system part of those uh, capabilities and things are spoken to. And then those are flowed down to groups like EVA or Orion or other system builders. So what are the actual methodologies that we use in that evaluation uh, part of that process? There are a lot of different things that go into it. Um, there are design impacts that you can spend a lot of time and uh, be very careful and methodical about. And there are some things that are very minor changes or concepts of the design that you can just do, or essentially um, expert opinion. We tend to like to go with the more involved and methodical methods because they do have a, a lot of reward to them. Uh, one of the very first stages, though, in human factors analysis is usually doing a task assessment, a task analysis. Um, and this can be at that very first stage where you identified a need for a new product or a new design. What you do is you evaluate how would that be used in the real uh, environment that it's going to be implemented in. If it's a, a software interface, like something generic like Microsoft Word, um, the designers for Microsoft Word might spend a month just looking at all the different types of people that use Word, uh, architects, writers, authors, business people, scientists, all the different folks that use it. And what sorts of documents do they write with Word? They might write technical papers. They might write you know, some sort of publication materials that they would submit to a journal. Uh, they may write marketing materials, things that they would have printed into flyers and distributed to stores. So it's, a, it's got a lot of different things that it could be used for. So their job of task analysis is very difficult. And they have probably 20 different engineers working on Word just doing that sort of thing. Uh, here, we don't have quite so many people. Uh, we do have a good cadre, though. and. Um, we have uh, task analyses for Orion Human Engineering that we interact with the prime contractor. We interact with the NASA design people, as well as the human system integration group. Uh, the actual design, of course, is engineering the product, making it go from concept uh, to a, an actual prototype or a rendering. Heuristic evaluation uh, is sort of a fancy word for professional judgment or expert evaluation. So we would sit down and use a certain methodolo methodological uh, approach to look at the design, think about how it interacts with the task analysis that was previously done. Uh, what are the pros? What are the cons? What are the different considerations that might drive any changes to that prototype? Uh, for testing and evaluation, uh, you could call this usability testing, ergonomic evaluation, human in the loop evaluation. There are a lot of different names that are used here. Um, ultimately, though, what you're doing is you're taking that product and you're getting it into an environment where you can have a user sit down, interface with it, use it, and then we'll collect additional data. We'll look at things like error rates, we'll look at uh, subjective perceptions of performance, um, whether or not it was achievable to even accomplish the task. There are sometimes designs that crop up, you can't quite do what you want with them. So uh, this process, again, would feed back into uh, the requirements and the prototyping later on. Uh, and then field feedback. If you're looking at a consumer product, out there that's been released by a company, a lot of times they have customer support calls. Uh, they get people calling up saying, my laptop doesn't work anymore, something like that, or I can't do with the word what I want to do with it. Uh, how do I interact with it? 
So that can give uh, valuable information to companies to change their design and come up with you know, version 8.0 or 9.0 or whatever. It's going to click for me. Our batteries are running a little bit low on this keyboard. Let's see here. Did someone advance? Ah, great, thank you. Uh, other things we look at, um, of course, the product fit would be something like uh, taking that prototype and comparing it again with the task analysis. Um, I mentioned error rates before, efficiency, things like time on task, how long does it take to accomplish the task. Uh, sometimes you might have three or four different concepts or prototypes you're comparing. Um, that's a very handy thing to have if you're at the early stage of design, because then you could look at uh, deltas in efficiency and error rates. If you have one particular prototype amongst three that has the lowest error rates and the highest efficiency or lowest time on task, that can lead you towards a design decision right there. Uh, you also have, as mentioned, subjective evaluation. And uh, you can look at trending over time as well. You can take a design and test it early on. And then as you iterate through this process over a period of time, look at any improvements or decrements. And if you make a change and you see a decrement in performance, well, that kind of suggests that you've done something that broke the design or you need to go back to what you had before and reinvestigate why you changed it. So how does this relate to NASA? I mentioned briefly before that we have the human systems integration groups. Uh, we have the HSR requirements. Um, I myself and several people in the room work with Orion Human Engineering on the NASA side. Uh, we have a habitability and human factors branch here at NASA within which many of us work. And there's also a, a human systems integration group out at Ames. So NASA has a lot of core capability in human factors and human systems integration. And um, I'll then talk about a little bit is what does Orion human engineering do? Uh, we're tied in at many different levels within the Orion project. Uh, everything from evaluation of requirements and how they've been flowed down uh, through the prime contract to the Orion design. Uh, we carry out hardware evaluations. We carry out software evaluations. Uh, we have human-in-the-loop testing that's done on many different levels, uh, from the very, very small aspects of components and, and slightly larger subsystems, all the way up to integrated evaluations, where we go into a mock-up over at the Space Vehicle Mock-up Facility. And we'll conduct uh, you know, full-scale tests with you know, four people or a crew complement or something of that nature. Uh, we also have uh, people working on lighting analysis and anthropometric concerns as well. So one example of how this would impact a design, uh, this is one from one of our folks that works on hardware uh, evaluations for the displays and controls console. Uh, she was looking at uh, the interaction of gloves, and this is a pressurized case, uh, with different edge keys and cursor control knobs on a potential display. And I believe this particular evaluation you can see on the slide, uh, there are different sizes of button that are being investigated. Uh, I don't recall if there are different knobs for the cursor control devices or not, but this is one way that you might evaluate two different button sizes, for example, uh, in a design. Uh, you could also unpressurize this glove box that it was done in and compare this in both a pressurized case and unpressurized case, and even remove the gloves and look at it in an ungloved case. So you can look at changes in efficiency and error rate amongst three different conditions, two different design prototypes, and um, it looks like there's several other things like depression force, how hard is it to press the button, perhaps travel distance, a few other variables. And based on this, they came up with a uh, decision, or at least one of several decisions on the baseline design for those edge keys. So that's uh, my little introduction to human factors and human system integration, human-centered design process. Any questions before I hand this over to Dr. Netta Ezer, who's going to talk about display formats and software and the way that we're implementing this in somewhat detailed of a perspective uh, within the Orion project. Great, thank you very much. Yes. Oh, microphone. Sorry. So I am Netta Ezer, and I recently joined the Orion Human Engineering team in October, and I've been working mostly on the side of software. And I'll be talking today about how we've been using the human-centered design process and the human-in-the-loop evaluations 
in the, dis the design of displays for Ovion. So displays are going to be very critical to the success of missions performed on Orion because the displays are going to be the way that the crew is going to know the status of the vehicle as well as be able to interact to change certain aspects of the vehicle. For instance, the crew might need to monitor certain temperatures or open or close valves, things of that nature. And we really want to produce the best displays where a crew doesn't have to go and search for information, they know where to go to find the information they need, they know how to interact with the displays um, efficiently and accurately. We want to make sure that the displays are intuitive and we do that by utilizing the crew's expectations and knowledge so that we reduce planning times. Uh, we also want to make sure that the displays provide enough feedback so that if the crew performs an action, for instance again closing a valve, they get the response of yes, that valve has been closed. One of the challenges um, involved in designing these displays is that we're trying to put a lot of information in a pretty constrained amount of space. So that has been one of the major challenges in developing these display formats. So in order to develop these displays has required the input from a lot of different stakeholders. And each one of these um, stakeholders gives their knowledge and insight, and they're very invested into the process of developing these display formats. For instance, system experts and engineers have the technical know-how of what is going on in the vehicle, and they know what type of information the vehicle can bring to the displays. Software developers and programmers know the technical um, issues behind the software, things like lag and, and what we're able to do technologically. We have designers who are invested in the layout and how the crew interacts with the displays. The crew office provides the knowledge and expectations about what they want to do in the vehicle and how they expect to interact with the displays. Um, human factors experts such as myself um, provide guidelines for um, how to develop displays using human factors principles and also carry out human in the loop evaluations. Um, mission operation experts provide notional procedures. They tell us um, what type of things they would ask the crew to do. And then we also incorporate safety and mission assurance representatives who ensure that what we're doing provides um, the utmost safety for crew on Orion. Now when we're designing these displays, we use an iterative process, which basically means we, we come up with designs through prototypes, we do a lot of evaluation and redesign, and we come back to new prototypes, and we we keep working and working. It's a very circular process until we come up with something that we're satisfied with. And part of this iterative process is doing human in the loop evaluations. And, we, and I'll explain, this is the way that we ensure that we're meeting requirements for crew performance as well as satisfaction with the design. So this diagram provides an overview of our process, and again, we're talking about an iterative process of developing these display formats. Early on, we have these early concepts that are largely driven by technology, um, the expertise from the engineers and systems experts. Um, from these, we come up with what type of information should be on the display. We then go into these low-fidelity prototypes, which we tend to do in PowerPoint. And this provides an easy, quick, inexpensive way to develop prototypes so we can move things around, change things um, based on our usability inspections. Um, we check for consistency across displays and within displays, and we make sure that the displays are adhering to certain standards about good design. And we rework these prototypes. And once we feel we have a pretty strong concept for a prototype, we go into the higher fidelity prototypes where these are interactive types of prototypes that would, for example, give the feedback that would be available on the actual vehicle. We use these higher fidelity prototypes to do human in the loop evaluations where we measure the usability of those prototypes with actual crew members. Um, what the results from the evaluations go back and feed into the prototypes. We do redesign based on the issues that came out of the evaluations. And we keep going through this process until finally we have something, a design for a display that we feel meets all of our objectives. 
So I'd like to delve in a little bit more into what we do in terms of the human in the loop evaluations and usability testing. So we do a lot of work before the actual evaluation. So a lot of the work involves doing, um, producing a test plan and producing test materials. One critical component is devising the tasks and procedures that the crew will perform with the interface. And we choose these tasks based on scenarios we come up with. So what type of tasks would the crew do frequently in the vehicle? What type of tasks are really important for the crew to do with the display? And sometimes we also include tasks just so the crew gets a feel for how to interact with all the different components on the display. Um, part of getting ready for the evaluation is coming up with other materials such as questionnaires, making sure we're measuring what we want to measure in terms of the success or failure of our design. Um, we also produce a script for evaluators to make sure that each evaluator um, explains the display in the same way to each participant. We obtain approval from the Committee for the Protection of Human Subjects to ensure that our studies are being conducted ethically. And we also go and we set up the environment and do practice run throughs just to make sure that when we do the actual evaluations, everything is going to go smoothly. Now when we do the actual evaluations, these usually involve six to eight crew members. And what's really important about this is these crew members have not been on the design team. We really want to get essentially fresh eyes on the display. As designers, we are just way too familiar with the design. Um, we know where information is, we know how to control things, and we really need these, um, this new viewpoint from people who are unfamiliar with the design to see if our assumptions are correct. Um, and oftentimes it's very enlightening when we bring these new people in to interact with the displays. Um, new issues arise that the designers didn't even anticipate. Um, and our basic procedure for the evaluation is we bring participants in individually. We do informed consent, which is very important because we want to convey um, that the participation is voluntary and also that data is going to be kept confidential. And we do this because we really want the participants to give their honest opinion about a display, even if that opinion is a very negative one. We want to um, build up confidence that whatever the participants say will take into consideration and will we'll, um, improve the design of the display. After the informed consent, we go over the formats, um, and then we do um, three different types of evaluations, and I'll go into more detail about those. We do a static evaluation followed by two dynamic evaluations. So for the static evaluation, we bring the display format up on the screen, and we ask participants to look at different features of the display format and give their initial impressions about it. So things like the overall layout, the organization of information, how dense the information seems on the screen, the use of color and text, is it legible, is it readable, um, things of that nature. And this allows us to get a, a glimpse that at, if the crew were to arrive on this page, would they understand what it's for? Do they understand the different components, how to interact with the display? And the static evaluation also serves as a way to prime the participants to start thinking about these issues and characteristics of the display as they're going through the rest of the evaluation and direct their comments toward these issues. Next we go into dynamic ev evaluations where the participants are given a set of procedures that they need to follow. Um, and it allows them to interact with the display format in a way that they would in, in real life. Um, and the first time we do this, we do this through manual procedures. So who are using a cursor control device to navigate through the display, they're pulling up pop-ups, interacting with different elements, entering numbers, and so forth. The second time we do the procedure, we use uh, notional electronic procedures, which serve as an automated aid for the participants, where certain pop-ups are queued up or numbers are entered, and it's a different way to interact with the display format. And we found it's really important to use these two ways because certain issues that come up in, um, with electro electronic procedures weren't found in, in when participants are using the display manually. For example, a recent um, evaluation we did was that a certain symbol to indicate a clue selection seemed apparent when the crew was using the display manually, but 
the use with the electronic procedures, that, that icon to represent the clue selection just wasn't salient enough. So because we did those two types of evaluations, we were able to go back and say, you know, we really need to change this icon and make it more obvious. And while we're doing these evaluations, we collect a lot of different types of data, both subjective and objective. So we collect participant comments, we record the actions that the participants are doing through um, data collection software that's running in the background. Um, we also do reaction times, we observe behavior, and we're also videotaping at the same time. At the end of the evaluation, we um, give the participants a questionnaire where they're asked to give ratings to certain characteristics of the display format. So things like, were they able to identify system states? Um, how was the use of color? Could they read the text? How was the terminology and things of that nature? And what we do, we combine these ratings into a subjective usability score that we can use to compare the subjective usability between different display formats. Um, and also it lets us hone in on which areas of the display format we really need to work on and, and um, improve upon. Um, it also helps us to elicit more comments from participants. For example, we'll say, you know, you gave um, text legibility a, a two, and maybe two isn't a, a good score. Um, how could we improve text legibility? And they would give us certain um, ideas for how to improve the design. Um, additionally, in the questionnaire, we, we put in questions that maybe the design team were debating about. So for example, um, maybe we're using a certain symbology that we want to make sure that it's representing what we think it represents. So we'll ask certain questions to the participants to make sure that um, we're covering our grounds in terms of um, being clear about what the display is and what it's for. When we're done with evaluation, we collect all the data and we use it to evaluate the design. So we do things like calculate error rates, error rates where we're looking at where participants made mistakes. And if there's consistency in those locations where mistakes are being made, that, that cues us in to maybe there's something going on with the display that we need to redesign and rework. Um, we see whether the participants felt that their expectations were being met. A lot of times participants will bring up, well, in shuttle we do it this way, or in the, on the space station we do it this way. And if the way we're doing it is completely opposite, then maybe we should reevaluate how we're doing things. <laughs> um, and we do uncover a lot of bad things about the display, but on the other hand, we do reveal a lot of good things about our display as well. Um, and so if there's something that's really good that we've designed, then we might incorporate it into standards so that we can carry those good components to other areas and other displays. Um, so example, in a recent evaluation, we found that a certain way to bring up information about a particular system um, was a very efficient way to, to pull things from a long list of, of systems. Um, so we thought that since this is so efficient, we could apply it to other display formats in the future. And what's really important is that it's really the combination of the subjective and objective data that give us the full picture of how usable our display format is. And from the evaluations, we produce a list of recommendations for how to improve the design. And we go back to the design team, present our findings, and we all work together, all the stakeholders, to really improve the design. Um, the synthesis has also allowed us to produce the standards where we recognize the good design components, we incorporate it into standards and carry that forward to other designs to ensure that um, all our display formats are being designed consistently. So just to summarize, the human-centered design process and human loop in the valuations have really resulted in a fast turnaround for us in terms of going from the concept generation to the format development. And this is because the stakeholders are putting their input in throughout the process. Um, we're making a lot of design improvements early on when we have these easy, cheap to change um, prototypes. We're not waiting till the last minute where we have a final prototype, realizing we made a mistake and then having to go and do a lot of free work. We've also managed to establish an effective process for future designs of of these display formats, whether it's building the standards 
um, or determining who gives what in types of inputs. Um, so this has really allowed us to focus less on the organization and management and more on just um, what we feel are uh, developing good designs. Um, so that's all I have, and I'll entertain any questions. Yes. Uh, your pool of crew members that you use to test your designs against, is that, is that from only from the, from the NASA astronaut core, or is it, where do you get your test subjects? It, um, th they're from NASA, and they're all experienced um, crew members, um, so. So that's, that's your only source, right? Yes. So, so um, get mm -hmm. other operational type people. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so people who have experience with shuttle and, and the space station is mostly the people that we have evaluated the displays with. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question. Um, working the FDOT contract, and one of the issues that I've come across is is um, what happens when you get put in a situation where they're already in the middle of their design process where you don't have the luxury of starting at the beginning and they've got displays and everything they've already had for years and years and years and they've only had a very cursory human factors input to that at the very beginning and so when I get put in that situation they're, they expect me to have some kind of human factors input to their design. Well, the design's already halfway in, in the design cycle run. They're only updating certain areas of the design, and, and they've got their users have been using this system for years and years, and so I don't have any fresh eyes to look at it. And, and uh, I guess that's kind of what, I mean, what do you do when you don't get to start at the beginning? You have to start in the middle. And that's been a problem with human factors in, in a lot of areas is, you know, coming in late and, and trying to patch things up. Uh, I think uh, a lot of times with human factors, you just have to, um, it's a lot about being a business person and selling yourself. And if you're coming in the middle, doing the best you can and, and maybe suggesting, well, if I come earlier, you know, I could have made these changes. And yeah. I, that was kind of my, my, my main frustration point is the users have seen a particular layout in their displays for a while and they're far enough in the design where if I wanted to change a bunch of things to improve the efficiency of the design or the usability of their system, you're kind of already several steps ahead so you're already having to use the sledgehammer so to say to and so you get the management types that say well you know we're, it's too late for that and so you're kind of stuck, well, here's my input, but there's not going to be any, anything come of it. Oh, uh, Gordon, did you want to talk well, about that? I was that? just going to say, a lot of times that is where, you know, having those uh, error rate data and the efficiency data, if you can show a, a significant reduction in the time it takes to accomplish a task, and you can show a, a dollar, you know, cost benefit analysis that relates to that, it's much easier to sell it up to management, especially if it's part of your deploying to a lot of customers. Uh, you could say, uh, you know, we're going to be able to impact your customers' bottom line this way as well, and they'll be grateful. Maybe they'll even spend a little bit more for the product if we can reduce the time it takes to get their job done. So there's a lot of ways you can try to sell that. So but you got to have the data. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess, you know, like I said, the users have been using the, the, the display and the design for so long that they're used to it. And so you don't have... You know, they know all the nuances on how to get around things and, you know, through their growing pains before they had the human factors in the process. And so it's difficult. And I understand what you're saying, and that's what I'm trying to do, but, but it, it's, it, it's difficult when the users have grown with the, what they've been given. And so, you know, they might have been able to correct a lot of the errors just from doing their own workarounds that may not be able to be you know, seen in, in new testing. And you're, and you're trying to prove a negative concept, you're trying to prove a negative result. So it'll be safer, trust me. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a hard sell. And I've worked safety before as well, and, and so, you know, it, yeah, it's, it, it's difficult to establish a reason for, you need to do this, or, or it'll 
be more usable this way. Well, the crew's been using it this way for years, and they haven't had a problem. That's the kind of response. Perseverance. Mm -hmm. Find out if they have had a problem or not. I mean, there may be a problem they don't even know about. Maybe there is an error that's being done. Maybe there have been, you know, impacts somewhere in the craft, you know, in the past. It just yeah. wasn't elevated management. You know, yeah. so I'll have to do some digging. Yeah. So <laughs> Well, I guess that was the point I was trying to make is a lot of times you don't get the luxury of starting at the beginning. Mm -hmm. There's a challenge. There's a question in the back. Just for, for you, there's a, a little trick I learned a long time ago when I did my field that counter intelligence training, which sounds really bizarre and weird, but it's <laughs> um, basically um, there, when you're in a powerless situation like that, there is one power that you always have, and then the grab is one of my instructors, and that is to use a consistent situation, the only power that you have, the power that does work, is consistent, persistent, logical argument. And that's all you can do. But it does work. Now, for you, Netta, I've got a question, okay. that is, yes. getting the 50,000 foot view of what he's going after is, are there any principles to unlearn that we should be looking at? Can you repeat Question. Yes, so um, just to get the question right, are there any principles to unlearn? Of unlearning. Of unlearning. How do you facilitate unlearning, which is what he's trying to do. Are there principles to that task that you can latch on to? Um, I think you have to go back to relearning, and sometimes you, as a human factors person, you have to evaluate mm -hmm. is there worth putting in that extra training for something that eventually will lead to improved performance and reduce errors? Or should we just say, you know, this is how the clue walks lane now, and you know, it's not the best way, but we're just gonna, you know, kinda put our cards somewhere else. And a, a good example is like the QWERTY keyboard. We all know it was designed to slow people down, but it's so ingrained in our culture life now that every attempt to kinda move to something else has, hasn't worked. So I think human factor is all about the balance. So sometimes you just have to say, you know, this is the way that people are used to doing it. I'm going to go and try to fight for something else. Any other questions? I want to thank everybody who actually came over and braved the weather to come over and, and see the <coughs> presentation or set of presentations. And I really want to thank. Um, uh, Dr. Ezer and Dr. Voss for presenting. Um, I hope that you're leaving today with a better understanding or appreciation for human-centered design process and some practical application that is uh, being applied as we speak to the Orion project and also uh, to be able to think of how that fits into the bigger picture of looking at human health and performance and considering human health and performance throughout the uh, the design cycle and through the operational error of the, of the product or system as well. And if you have, I hope you've, you've signed up on the sign-up sheet. If you haven't, please do so before you leave. Uh, this uh, presentation uh, will is being recorded and it will be posted um, online and we usually send out um, a notice in JSC today to let folks know when it's posted. And um, if you have any questions that weren't addressed here today, uh, my name is on the flyer. Again, I'm Debbie Burridge. Feel free to contact me or you can contact our, contact our presenters directly um, or anyone on our uh, human engineering team uh, and we'll make sure that your questions are answered. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you.